Hey, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Alabama EMS Challenge. Uh, we've got uh, Dr. White and Dr. Kurt, both from UAB, here with us today. And uh, so we're ready to get started. So we're going to start off with, uh, with Dr. White. Uh, just a little housekeeping items here. Uh, we got Dr. Ferguson's name and contact information up here. If you have any questions, concerns, comments, uh, Alabama EMS Challenge. You probably see this every week when he goes over it. So for Con Ed, um, I assume email is still the preferred and the contact information is there at the bottom. Yeah, actually, if you'll check the q and I'll be putting the link to the attendance form up here in just a minute. But otherwise, uh, you can send an email to alabamaemschallenge at gmail.com. Get an automated reply with a link to the attendance form. All right. Let's get started here. So quick early EKG review. It's going to be a little bit different with fewer people in the room from the last time I did this. Um, what do y'all see? We always start. Is it fast or is it slow? Okay-ish. Okay. Is it wide? Is it narrow? Narrow. Okay. P waves or no? QRS complexes for each P wave. Okay, so then what's the next elephant in the room? Elevation where? Okay. Any others? Okay. Maybe start to push V4. What would you what would you be concerned about? This patient's having chest pain. Okay, so where anatomically is that STEMI? Anterior, right? Okay. So same process here. Slow or fast? If you know the answer, feel free just to jump in and say what it is too, except for Dr. Court. What is this here? The same patient having chest pain. What do you have here? Okay, rates all right. Wide or narrow? Narrow. Narrow. P waves and P waves for every, and QRS for every P. Probably. Probably. Looks like it for the most part, right? So again, here, what's the elephant in the room? to hit that elevation where right so anatomically what would you say right so kind of an anterolateral maybe high lateral c1 and avl as well okay what about this <clears throat> okay good very good. Fast or slow? A little fast. P waves? Uh, yeah. yeah. Probably not. <clears throat> so, what's your differential for this? So, the rate's up there, but how else can we guess the rate if the rate wasn't up there? Or not guess, but make an educated guess at it, if you will. Okay, right. So using the blocks, what what is the rough estimate of the rate on this? Perfect. So you got about 150, no obvious P waves, narrow complex, very regular. So would this be consistent with like an A fib or an A flutter? No. I see a few head shaking. No. Why? pretty regular so what's the other fast svt so some super ventricular okay but this one's actually technically sinus tack there are p waves there but yes okay svt would be on your differential for this okay okay fast or slow okay a little fast 
Okay, wide or narrow? <laughs> Okay. Ish. All right. Ish. Okay. P ways. All right. So there are P waves. Is this a STEMI? There you go. So don't forget about left bundle branch block and the use of Scarbosa criteria. There's actually also modified Scarbosa criteria, which gets pretty in depth. Um, so this is discordant, okay, right? So your um, QRS downward forces, okay, leading into your T segment, right? So they're discordant. So you need about five millimeters on your original Scarbosa criteria, you need about five millimeters uh, of elevation and two contiguous leads for it to count as a STEMI, okay? So it was just a left funnel branch block. Okay, all right. So just go through the process every time. Okay, narrow, good. Yeah. Okay. So anatomically, so if this is a STEM and you're worried about it, where is it? It's an inferior MI, right? Okay. I'll try to get through these relatively quick. All right. Very good. How would you describe those P waves? They don't look alike. You got it over here. Sawtooth. That's a pretty classic pattern. Sawtooth, right? Okay. Atrial flutter. Okay. Regular sinus rhythm. Okay. <laughs> Narrow. So we talked a little bit about the differential earlier, so start thinking back to your differential on what that could be. So if it's regular, okay, so it could be sinus with buried P waves. They're just so fast, the P waves are buried in the T's where they don't exist, sometimes difficult to tell. Right, so sometimes it's hard to tell, right? So here, this is SVT. Inferior, so. <laughs> Maybe kind of hard to tell. Okay. So if there are no P waves, what else would that bring up in your differential for the rhythm? Junctional. Right, so it's kind of wide, it's junctional, likely coming from below the AV node. Okay, here, just another left bundle branch block. All right, let's get into a little bit of a talk here. Okay, so we'll run this as a case. So you get a 911 call about a 52 year old male that's found down by a neighbor, he's minimally responsive. Uh, unknown mental status, they're looking at him through a window, but they can't get inside. Okay, so what are you thinking? That's, that's, the, that's the call out, that's the information you have en route. What are you starting to think about? What could this be? Cardiac arrest, what else? Blood sugar. Okay, so call, let that call in tox. Okay, so good overdose of any kind. Fall, stroke, okay. 
So pretty broad differential, right? So tox, carbon monoxide, seizure, syncope, stroke, cardiac arrest, blood sugar, and a lot of others. Okay, so on arrival, you find a patient who's somnolent, confused, he's slow to respond to questions. You get a little bit more information from the neighbor. She called because she heard a loud yell, a pop, and then a thud that came from the patient's apartment unit. Okay. When you look around inside the apartment, you notice that the stove is pulled away from the wall, outlet's exposed with the black mark above it and powers out to the unit. Okay. What do you think now? We got electrocuted. Pretty good chance it might have got electrocuted, okay? So start to get vitals, stable vitals, little sinus brady on the monitor. He's mentally responsive. He's slow to improve, but he's start he's slow to respond, but he's starting to improve during transport. Okay. Um, he tells you that there's really no known past medical history. He didn't have any ID bracelet on. You didn't find any medications, drug paraphernalia, chemicals, or other odd um, items in the house. Okay. All right. So he's complaining of intense, diffuse pain that is worse in his chest, uh, associated with some shortness of breath, specifically with taking deep breaths. Well, this bullet's not going to come down below, and it might. Paresthesia to his right hand. Stacy he remembers entering into his kitchen with plans to cook something and noticed that his stove wasn't working. Okay. Yeah. Gee, is there any way to get rid of that bar on the bottom? I think a few of my slides are going to have a bullet point below that. If not, then we'll just deal with it. All right, that's fine. That's fine. So that was just really thoughts, and we had already started to talk about it. All right, so you notice this on his hand. Okay, so electrocution, right? All right, so estimate about a thousand deaths per year from electrocutions. Over a thousand volts is considered a high voltage injury. The suspicions start to get really high about significant injury at a thousand volts. Okay, however, in looking at the, the literature for this, it's a bit of an arbitrary number. There's not a good definition or a good reason why this was chosen. Okay, um, the injury rate starts to increase at 600 volts have this kind of bimodal distribution, accidents versus work-related. Okay? Typically in your household, it's going to be those under the age of six. Teenagers are more often to be tied up in high power, high voltage power lines and is the second leading cause of occupational death, 90% in men. Okay, we make smart decisions. Yes. <laughs> so. Um, lightning, kind of a separate category, if you will. All right, about 300 injuries, 100 deaths a year. It's got about a 15% mortality rate, okay, or an 85% survival rate. Um, the mortality is typically due to a fatal arrhythmia, all right? 90% are going to occur in the spring or the summer, um, with about 75% being outdoors. I couldn't figure out where the other 25% technically occurred. Thought that would have been a more interesting number to break down, uh, but wasn't reported. Right. <laughs> so, and, unless, I don't know, shed, garage car, something, hard to say, okay. Um, true injuries from the electrical weapons is pretty rare. Depends. So the physics of it. Um, so we talk about the flow of the electrons that are going down a gradient. OK. This is uh, one measurement is current. It's the volume of the electrons per second measured in amperes. All right. But we talk about volts. Why do we talk about volts? Well, because current equals the voltage divided by the resistance or voltage equals the current multiplied by the resistance. This becomes very important in water. Because what does water do? Conducts. So what does it do to resistance? Decreases resistance, right? So if you're going to keep V the same and you decrease R, what must happen to I? Has to go up. OK, so current goes up, resistance goes down. All right, so the primary determinant of the injury, which the current is directly proportional to the voltage and inversely proportional to the R, and in our case, it's going to be the tissue. It's about 120 volt circuit, one milliamp versus three milliamps versus 10. Okay, 10 milliamps about where you start to feel pain versus 100 milliamps is where you start to run the risk of going into V-fib. 
low voltage across low resistance equals high or i'm sorry verse high voltage across high resistance all right so it's going to define your injury pattern go forward here chief we're not moving there we go. Okay. Yeah. Volts. So we talk about volts. So we're. We'll get into that. Okay. We'll break down the different currents. Okay. So resistance is a function of the contact applied and the presence of moisture, the contact pressure and presence of moisture, which we've already kind of started to highlight a little bit. So if you increase resistance, all right, so tissues such as skin, bone, fat, they're gonna heat up and coagulate rather than just transmit. But that's gonna be until the point that that tissue is then gone, it creates a hole, all right? Once that happens, if you can get access then into the deeper tissues where you get nerves, blood vessels, mucous membranes, and muscles, these are good conductors, okay? This is where the current's gonna start to easily flow and start to transmit through the body, all right? This is uh, essentially why most of the damage occurs on the inside and any exterior wounds, injuries that you find are not going to be indicative of what may be going on in the deeper tissue, okay? So we already talked a little bit about the effect of water, okay? Remembering that volts equals the current multiplied by the resistance. So essentially, once you get inside those tissues that have lower resistance, I'm not touching anything, so I'm not sure if that's me doing that or. I think the uh, I think the mouse is moving around. Just... Okay. okay. No, no worries. Oh, yeah, there it went. Okay. <laughs> All right. So we've already talked a little bit about what happens to current with resistance. All right. So types, AC versus DC, right? So leading to your question, AC is the alternating current. So the direction of the flow is actually cyclical back and forth, all right? So households about 60 cycles a second, all right? Typically low voltage, 110 to 220. However, it's repetitive and prolonged contact perpetuating as in you tend to grab it, okay? Why do you tend to grab? Which muscles? So you've, so you've got flexors and extensors. Flexors. So your flexors tend to be stronger than your extensors. Okay. So you're going to tend to grab it and hold on to it. Okay. So welders can actually result or end up having suffocation injuries, even from just kind of this low grade AC current. Okay. They can get uh, respiratory muscle paralysis. All right. End up suffocating. DC direction of flow is constant. Okay, things like what we've got up here: batteries, railway, automobile, and lightning. Kind of, we'll talk a little bit more specifically about lightning. Tends to result in a single muscle spasm that tends to throw the victim. Okay, so it's a short duration, but there's increased risk of trauma due to that fall or, or due to that kind of explosive um, nature. All right, so lightning is most is closest to dc type current okay it's a direct strike it's the worst there's a side flash contact strikes ground current um, and step what we call step potentials okay another risk with lightning is within just a couple milliseconds it can superheat essentially anything that you're wearing metal wise rings watches necklaces earrings etc and you can get uh, pretty severe burn injuries from anything that you're wearing as well Okay, so uh, I think we already talked about that a bit. All right, so injury patterns. Again, we talked a little bit about it going to be related to the amount, duration, type, path in your environment, okay, specifically water. Mechanism of injury, you're going to have direct effect on the body tissue. All right, we talked about superficial versus the deeper tissues and then the cardiac, respiratory, derm, and the musculoskeletal system. All right, electrical, got to worry about thermal energy. Okay, and then there's blunt injury, lightning muscle contractions, and then falls most commonly after a lightning strike. Patients have uh, 
shoulder dislocations. All right, so there's also four classes. You have entry and or entrance and exit wounds. Again, we've talked, they do not predict the path or degree of internal injury. There's flash burns in which your clothing can catch fire, right? Um, I'm sorry, flash burns, current strikes the skin, uh, doesn't penetrate, and then there's the flame, the clothing that catches fire thereafter. Okay, we talked a little about lightning being close to DC type current, anywhere from 10 million to 2 billion volts with temps that reach over 30,000 Kelvin. That's uh, hotter than the sun's surface, okay? And can generate a shock wave up to 20 atmospheres. Okay, so cardiac, we talked already a little bit. The most common uh, issue here is gonna be dysrhythmias. All right, 15% occurrence within the first few hours. Asystole, most common with DC or lightning. Okay, more likely a defib, kind of the, as long as the pacemaker cells aren't fried when you're struck, then it's very similar to defibbing a patient, right? The heart should restart, right? So what's the problem here? What, what's gonna happen to a patient? If you think this, I don't make sure, I, don't have, well, I already have it up there, sorry. Okay, so they can actually die of a respiratory paralysis, okay? So the pacemaker cells can restart in the heart, their heart rate comes back, but the respiratory muscles are still paralyzed. And so they essentially end up suffocating. Okay, these can outlast cardiac effects. <clears throat> V-fib occurs most commonly with AC current. Okay, it's the most fatal arrhythmia, up to 60% occurs when traveling from one hand to the other, right? So we kind of, we've got a pretty decent way with our SA node of getting out of a DFib. We don't really have a good way of getting out of VFib, getting ourselves out of VFib. All right. So at higher voltage, this difference actually tends to disappear. Okay. Enough AC volts going through, it's going to mimic DC. Okay. Can result in a number of cardiac dysrhythmias, first secondary blocks, bundle branch blocks, QT prolongation, PACs, PVCs, AFib, things like that, oftentimes attributed to electrolyte disturbances, elevated potassium and calcium levels due to cell destruction. Okay. Damage to the myocardium itself is actually uncommon. All right. Results uh, really would just be from either the shockwave blast or some sort of heat injury or contusion. All right, I don't remember what I've got here. Walk around. Okay, so we, what type of triage do you do? Lightning strike injury. What's the kind of the buzzword here? Rapid. Starts with an R. Reverse. Reverse triage, right? So walking wounded, anybody's awake talking to you, external injuries, but they're still able to communicate. You actually want to give more time and attention to those that you may have typically triaged as a red or a black, okay? for this very reason, that it may just be the fact that they need a little bit more time before the respiratory muscles recover <clears throat> and they can be revived. So we talk about the renal system, all right? Most commonly you're gonna see what we call rhabdomyolysis, essentially a lot of cell destruction, you get an increase in the patient's CK, urine myoglobin starts to back up in the renal system, can cause kidney failure, all right? Acute kidney injury, all right? We talk about extravascular, uh, extra av, hypovolemia, this is pre-renal, um, we refer to as acute tubular necrosis. Neurologically, patients can suffer loss of consciousness, weakness, paralysis, respiratory depression, autonomic dysfunction, memory problems, seizures, kind of just across the board. They have sensory and motor deficits secondary to the peripheral nerve damage. It can be patchy. It may not correlate with a typical distribution like you would expect in a stroke, right? We talk about in stroke, trying to localize the lesion based on their symptoms. Okay. This may not, this is unlikely to follow a typical nerve distribution, All right? Evidence of this can be delayed. It may come up months later. Okay. They can have delayed spinal cord syndromes. Coronal paralysis is kind of this temporary paralysis secondary to lightning. Um, they get this blue kind of mottled and pulseless extremity. It's more common in the lower extremities versus the upper um, and thought to be due to vascular spasms. 
lightning. So you can actually, when you assess the patient, their pupils can be fixed and dilated or even asymmetric. Um, don't bank your assessment on the fact, okay, I, they're not breathing, they got fixed dilated pupils, I don't detect a heartbeat. All right, go ahead and resuscitate these patients. They can suffer from the hypoxic encephalopathy, intracranial hemorrhage strokes, spinal fractures, tympanic membrane ruptures. Okay, they can develop cataracts, um, hyphemas, vitreous hemorrhage, optic nerve. These are all injuries within the eye. Burns of any degree, right? Common point of electrical contact and places in contact with the ground. Um, they may end up needing, they really should go to a trauma center. They may end up needing an escarotomy. Okay, again, we keep talking about external injury does not correlate with internal injury. You can see oral burns in children from chewing. Okay, we talk about our kind of buzzword is the labial artery in children in the lip. These can have a delayed bleed. They get this burn, they get a little escar over it, and that escar falls off at a later date, and they just get this profuse arterial bleed that can be very difficult to stop. All right, so we talk about don't debris, don't cleanse, um, apply petroleum jelly-based antibiotics, and these individuals are gonna end up needing usually a plastic surgery or some sort of oral surgeon follow-up. Okay, lightning rarely results in deep burns. I mean, it certainly can. All right, again, it's a short duration of contact. You get this kind of flashover effect where it travels over the skin. Get this Lichtenberg pattern, okay, that you'll see on the skin. I've got a picture of it here in a second that you'll see. All right, moisture that may be in the area can vaporize rapidly, resulting in steam burns. Right? Can be expansion, okay, of the water converting to steam can cause clothing to essentially explode off, all right? could be just enough, uh, the moisture on your skin could be enough to do that. So for the same reason we talked about earlier, the deeper uh, burns with lightning are actually rare, okay? And you've got, again, the resistance of the tissues long before you get down into the, the deeper tissues into the blood vessels, okay? So that's a Lichtenberg pattern. All right, so musculoskeletal system. Again, we talked a little bit earlier, bones have the highest resistance, okay? Greatest amount of heat are actually gonna develop. So if it does get down into those tissues, you can get these deep thermal injuries, especially within the long bones. Okay, we call peri what we refer to as periosteal burns, destruction of the bone matrix, osteonecrosis. Um, you can get fractures from falls, blast, or stress, okay, tetanic contractions essentially, All right? You have tissue necrosis plus edema can result in compartment syndrome. What do y'all know about compartment syndrome? Okay, what's more of the issue? What are we worried about in compartment syndrome? What are you looking for? What do you, okay, so, right. So it's why is there no blood flow, okay? you got some reason to have edema within that tissue compartment, has nowhere to expand, and it starts to compress. And that's when we talk about the five Ps, right? Chief started to hit on pulselessness, pallor, paresthesia, right? Those are the things that you're going to be looking for, right? These patients may end up needing what we call fasciotomies, where essentially we just cut the tissue, cut the skin, and allow room for expansion. Hey, Doc, I think a lot of people often get confused between Syndrome and crush. All right, so <clears throat> crush going to be that pressure injury. Okay, can still result in compartment syndrome once that's removed. Okay, it's the same concept that tissue edema that builds up. There's a few more issues that come along with crush syndrome. You can have uh, electrolyte disturbances. I know when I went through EMT school, we talked early on about how this can develop, this hyper-K, avoid potassium-containing fluids, but actually we don't see that until kind of later down the road, right? That's typically not going to be a problem for EMS unless it's been a prolonged extrication, hours extrication to get that patient out, right? So crush injuries, they can result in compartment syndrome but that's typically gonna be after you've extricated the patient and now their tissue edema, the blood flow is returning where it can, 
if there's not vascular disruption, the result of cell uh, lysis, the release of contents, and all the inflammatory process that can occur. Vascular injuries. Kind of goes to your question or comment earlier. You can get coagulation of the small blood vessels. It's typically going to be an injury that occurs most more commonly with electrical um, over lightning. Again, just due to the time, we talked about contact time, the pressure applied, and the resistance of the tissues. And then the voltage. Okay. There can be delayed arterial thrombosis, things like aneurysm with rupture. So you get the, the vasculature that can start to necrose, develops this clot along the area of necrosis. And then that clot, just like any other clot, we talk about strokes, heart attacks, can thrombose and embolize. Okay. So physical exam. Kind of go back to our patient here. He was a 52-year-old male, as well appearing but confused. He was afebrile with stable vital signs. His ABCs were intact. We call normal cephalic atraumatic, so no head injury was identified. He did have eye movement, equal um, ocular motions intact. Pearl, his TMs were still intact. All right. He was in a normal sinus rhythms, regular rate. He didn't have any murmurs, rupture, gallops. His respiratory uh, normal, non labored. He was following commands, but very slow to do so. Seemed, still seemed a bit confused. So his MSK exam, so based on his right hand, the pain, the paresthesias, and his skin findings, we did get an x-ray on arrival. He actually had fourth and fifth metacarpal fractures of the hand. Skin findings, some pictures of his hand. And then further detailed skin exam, this is about the only other injury we found. So what, what does that make you think? So that's his right hand and his left foot. Possibly. Okay. Right. We questioned it. Wasn't really sure. Right. So if he's household on a stove, what, what do you think the volts were? Most of you guys I expect to know. Probably, probably 220. Okay. So less than that 600 volts. It's kind of hard to say. We ended up admitting him for observation just because right hand, left foot. We weren't sure the path of travel did have the fractures. All right, so some things that we're going to check when you guys get these patients to us. OK, we're going to get an EKG. Hopefully you guys have already done one as well. We're going to look at a CBC, a BMP, specifically looking at electrolytes. We're going to get a CK. This goes back to the rhabdomyolysis cell destruction release of cellular contents, okay, creatinine kinase. This is a number that we're going to look at and consider it, whether the patient has any potential for renal injury, right? That acute kidney injury. You know, what essentially happens is kind of just fills up the kidneys and, and backs them up, if you will. These patients just end up needing just liters and liters of fluid to keep their urinary output up before they don't go into kidney failure. Possibly troponin. There's not a lot of evidence for this. Okay, we talked a little bit about there's not typically a lot of damage to the myocardium unless it's a blunt injury or they somehow managed to get superheated or is a direct injury. Right, most people are still going to get it. All right, because that's one of the things that we are worried about is a cardiac dysrhythmia, but there's not a lot of correlation between troponin and the risk of cardiac dysrhythmia. Do what? So any appropriate radiographs are going to be based on your clinical exam and type of current. Was it a AC or DC? Okay, you may want to consider a CT scan of their head, their spine, chest, abdomen, pelvis, essentially for uh, trauma-related injuries if they had a fall. Okay. Treatment. We talked already a little about reverse triage. We talked about why. Okay. ABCs, IVO2, put them on the monitor. Okay. High energy, <laughs> over 1,000 volts. Okay, Definitely need to get an EKG, have them on the monitor, but I would just recommend that any electrical injury, just go ahead and have them on the monitor, get your EKG. Okay, We already talked a little bit about on the last slide, the troponin. Um, the diagnostic values of cardiac markers is really not studied. IV fluids, right? 
most folks say try to use the Parkland formula. What you need to know though is this again, we've talked about the external injuries are not going to be indicative of internal injuries. So Parkland formulas and, and resuscitation fluids, there's really not a good way to calculate what these folks may need. So we're really just going to be looking at uh, urinary output, hourly urinary output. Okay, avoiding potassium containing fluids. All right, Chief brought this up. We're going to treat like a crush injury. Okay, there's going to be a lot of cell destruction that occurred. <clears throat> and again, monitor urinary output. Let's see, going to continue to monitor for compartment syndrome. So in this gentleman here with the right hand, that may be something that you want to consider keeping a patient for and watching them is continued compartment checks in the hand and the forearm. Okay, maybe in that foot. Okay, dermatological injuries, treat them essentially as you would any burn patient. There was something, some discussion in literature about using penicillin uh, type creams, ointments, if you're worried about a clostridial infection. So this occurred, uh, depending on the environment which this occurred outdoors in the woods, if they had a, a real dirty wound, right? Um, especially if you're concerned for any sort of significant muscle breakdown, myonecrosis, and like some large, any large open wound, okay? You may want to consider just empiric antibiotic therapy. All right. Um, interestingly enough, GI injuries are very uncommon. Okay. Most commonly, it's just what we call an adynamic ileus. It's just the medical term for your bowels aren't working, nothing's moving forward. It's not the same as an obstruction. Right. Not much to do about this other than just watch it with time. All right. Um, these patients are going to need to see an ophthalmologist. You know, we talked about they can have delayed injuries, cataracts, may not come up for days to years till after, most commonly with a lightning injury. Radiographs we mentioned just kind of as needed and the life-saving tetanus that we always give every patient when they come into the trauma bay. All right, so what are we doing with these patients? A high voltage injury, again, that arbitrary thousand volts most often these folks are going to get monitored for monitored for 12 to 24 hours on telemetry so on the cardiac monitor looking for the development of any cardiac dysrhythmias okay but again take into account their medical history do they have heart disease were they having significant chest pain and that was another reason we ended up admitting this guy you know it was 220 we weren't weren't really sure that what was on his left foot was uh there prior to the injury or not um, but he had, had complained of a significant amount of chest pain with difficulty breathing uh, following that injury. Okay, Loss of consciousness or if there ever was a documented arrhythmia, if you guys got on the scene and found the patient in AFib that spontaneously resolved prior to arrival, and okay, that's good information for us to know. Okay. Asymptomatic patients with a low voltage injury and a normal physical exam, they're clear to go home, out the door. Mild symptoms, minor cutaneous burns, normal EKG, negative urinalysis. We're probably just going to observe them and discharge them with close follow up. Okay, we talked about admitting these patients is basically again used on clinical judgment, past medical history, injury, et cetera. All right, um, something to consider if your patient is pregnant. All right having your OB come down, getting a formal ultrasound, or at least getting them to a facility with obstetrics, right? Not a, not a big difficult uh, disposition here for you guys in the Birmingham area. We're pretty fortunate to have what we have from the hospital systems, okay? But if you work uh, in a rural location, um, in the hospital that you go to may not have on-call OB, they may not have, let's say, ultrasound capability outside of business, regular business hours. All right, so if you guys work in a uh, location such as that, you may want to consider bringing them to a facility with those capabilities because um, they can get placental abruptions. Um, most commonly, lightning strikes can have up to a 50% fetal mortality. Okay. And that's all I got. So, a couple of questions. Um, the lightning injuries are pretty fascinating. Um, the, is it looked in? Lichtenberg, Lichtenberg uh, pattern. pattern or scar is not actually a burn. Is that correct? 
Yeah, it's just a, a skin development that occurs typically uh, well after the, the strike, something that develops there. Oh, there, there was destroy the pigment. Yeah, does that go away? So actually, I, I read some literature that some people, it fades and then it will come back at different times of their life under different physiological conditions. So it's pretty mysterious. Yeah. I, I, I couldn't find any definitive reasons or explanation for how it happens or what makes it go away or come back. Anyway, pretty, pretty interesting. On the fluid for like say a lightning strike or a severe burn, um, I know you put on your slide Parkland formula doesn't really work because we're not going by body surface area. So for our setting, pretty much fluid bolus be very reasonable to do. Okay, but again, just take the patient's medical history into um, consideration as well. You know, if they're CHF with you know, EF 10%, you know, be careful. It may just be, and depending on your transport time, but very reasonable to give a fluid bolus. And then we can check when you get to the ED, check your analysis, and we can check the CK and for things like that, just to kind of get a, an idea or a gauge. And then um, urinary output. And you know, again, take into context the volts that they got hit with? Was it a lightning strike? Was it a 110, a 220, or did they somehow, you know, is this you know, somebody that was up in a lift and got tangled up in, in a power line, right? So. We had a uh, we had a really tragic call many years ago with a city worker that got shot with a high tension power line, actually twice up in a bucket truck. And um, so his, his tissue was burning when we got there, so. His clothes were burning as well, but his tissue was burning. So it was pretty um, intuitive to put his clothes out. What wasn't intuitive was we had to put his skin out before we could start uh, caring for him. And he did survive. He was very severely injured and he never lost consciousness, which was very disconcerting for everybody involved. Yeah, I didn't a metal clipboard. Yeah. Like, All right, any other questions for uh, Dr. White? The big thing there would be seeing safety too before you go you know, start using any sort of water or other agents to try to bring that out. <laughs> safety. Yeah. All right, everybody, we're going to take about a 10 minute break and, and uh, set up for Dr. Kurt. Uh, stretch your legs a little bit. Feel free to do that. And we'll be back with you here in just a few minutes. Welcome back. We're going to get started back with Dr. Kurtz going to talk to us about research and a few other details about uh, cardiac arrest resuscitation. Yeah, thanks guys. Um, I'm glad the topic of research didn't scare everybody off. Um, and we'll talk, so it's going to, we're going to talk about, uh, actually let me just start off with disclosures here. And I'm not able to move forward. It's actually pronounced Kurt, as if there's an R in it. Doesn't? Kurt. Yeah, it says Orion. Yeah. yeah, I can't move forward on the here. Yeah. No, there's just be like an umlaut thing over the U that we just dropped. Yeah. There it is, got it, awesome. Just needed to tap the screen. Um, so as far as disclosures, I have some research funding to study cardiac arrest by SAEM um, and have included some of my own data in the talk here today. Um, so we're gonna talk national cardiac arrest outcomes since eCPR is part of uh, the talk here. And then research basics itself is, is, is too broad of a topic. So we're gonna focus on just randomized control trials. And then next time I come back, we'll pick something um, something else, especially because RCTs are in the news everywhere uh, right now. And then we'll talk about probably the coolest thing right now in emergency medicine is eCPR. Um, so for cardiac arrest, you guys know um, the burden of disease is huge. There's over 450,000 deaths per year for sudden cardiac arrest. It's about 1,200 uh, deaths per day. Um, another way you can look at it is if you have nine 737s full of passengers crashing fatally every single day, um, that's the number of deaths. Um, and it's the third leading cause of death and disability in, in the United States. This is a paper we published last year in circulation where on the y-axis here up and down, you have the leading causes of death and disability. It's a measure called DALI. Um, and then we, using the CARES database, which I know we're part of here now, um, 
calculated what out of hospital cardiac arrest is alone. The blue is mortality, YLL, it's years of life lost. So if your life expectancy is 73 and you die at 70, you lost three years. Um, and then the, the red is disability. So you can see that really for out of hospital arrest, you can really see the red. There's a little bit there, but the majority is um, is life loss, so so death, whereas low back and neck pain, nobody's really dying. I mean, certainly spinal epidural abscess is in there and things like that, but for the most part, it's more morbidity than mortality. Um, and this is a paper we just submitted to resuscitation that's currently under review that's looking at the burden of disease over time. And actually, out of hospital arrest, if you look at the CARES database over the past five years, it's actually the largest growth in um, in death and disability, um, the next is drug uh, is drug overdose. Um, I'm certainly COVID will be added into this and may sort of change things. Um, overall, survival rates are low. When you look on a national level, if you have a cardiac arrest inside the walls of a hospital, you have about a one in four chance of leaving alive. This isn't talking neuro intact. This is just you being having a pulse, um, and then about one in eight for an out of hospital arrest. And unlike pretty much any other condition, um, where you live really mat matters. There's large geogra geographic variability in survival. Um, so this is the nickel paper. This is the rock data from 2008 that sort of made waves in JAMA. This is looking at survival of hospital discharge. So this is not um, survival neurologically intact, which we now know is obviously the most meaningful measure that we want. And they found a five-fold variation in survival. Um, Seattle, um, about 16%, and here in Birmingham, it's around 3%. We'll, we'll get to why that probably is um, in just a little bit. Um, a decade later, same analysis was done. However, this is now de-identified. So the sites are there, there on the left. And we see again, about a, a four to five fold variation um, in survival throughout the rock sites. Um, a paper that I published in Mich uh, out of when I was in Michigan doing some research um, back in 2018 just looked at survival variation by essentially by county. It was in medical control authority, which is how the EMS system was broken up. But you can think of it as sort of county based. And when you control for population density, depending on where you are in the mitten, um, your survival, uh, this is neurologically intact survival. Um, there's quite a bit of variation. Um, if you even go even more granular just within a building, um, you guys know this because you you respond to all of these, uh, that if you're uh, on the 16th floor, it's hard to transport somebody down there. That person's in big, big trouble um, if they're in cardiac arrest. And really statistically, if you're above a third floor or above, that's when your chance of survival um, goes down compared to if you are just on a, the same exact person on a lower floor. Why are outcomes so bad? Um, and it really, it, it talks to the complexity of arrest. I know you guys have all seen the chain of survival and that we know that in order for a good outcome to happen, each link in the chain of survival has to be really strong. And there's a ton of variability that can happen at each one of these links that um, if one is weak, then all of a sudden we're not going to have a great outcome. Um, probably one of the, I think one of the best papers that didn't get a lot of attention a few years back was saying that the links in the chain are not all created equal. That for out of hospital arrest, it's really front ended. We need bystanders that are able to recognize arrest, provide high quality CPR. I've really, I've done a couple of shifts with uh, the EMS crew um, and I haven't had an arrest. So I haven't been on scene. I'm not a medic. I haven't been on scene to see what bystander CPR is like in real life. But I would imagine you guys have seen it quite a bit. And how often is it really high quality CPR that's being done? Non-existent. Exactly. Yeah, so usually we don't see bystander CPR. Yeah. Occasionally it's good CPR, but very, very rare. No, but I, I want to mention, and I wish the American Heart Association would do away with that circle that says early CPR to buy time, mm -hmm. because that's just not what CPR is for. CPR, in my estimation, is what resuscitates the patient. Yeah. Um, so that's the big problem I have with the uh, chain of survival, but you're absolutely, absolutely right. The, the links certainly have a variation in importance and magnitude. Sure. And when we look at the, the places in the country in the world that have the highest outcomes, what do they have in common? They have robust telephone CPR programs, so dispatch assisted CPR that doesn't ask the bystander, do you know CPR? They instruct them to do it right away. Um, and then also highly educated bystanders are going to be able to recognize CPR, be able to use an AED, um, and um, also be able to perform high quality CPR. 
So how do we improve outcomes? And this is, there's a lot of ways that this can happen, but this sort of fits what I'm interested in because I'm um, ultimately, hopefully going to be staying around here just to, to do a lot of research, um, is we need to improve research. And when you look at um, the research landscape, there's a lot that needs to be done. If we look at the 2015 ACLS guidelines, there were 315 new recommendations if you compare that to 2010. Of those, nearly three quarters were level of evidence C. That's expert opinion. So that's a bunch of people that study cardiac arrest sitting around a room saying that I think this is the direction we should go. But it's not based off of high quality data. There were only 1% that were level of evidence A. That's randomized control trials that we're going to go over. So overall, um, not a lot of research being done. We certainly need a lot more. And this is for adults. If you look at pediatric, um, it's even way less data being uh, being produced. Over the past 20 years or so, there's been less than five cardiac arrest randomized controlled trials yearly, and that's not even this is not in the country. That's in the world. Um, so just saying that there there needs to be more. Um, and then uh, this is uh, this is a paper that I uh, put out a few years ago, looking at what cardiac arrest oh. research funding is like. Um, if you look, if you call the NIH and say, how much money do you put towards MI research or how much money do you put towards stroke, they'll be able to give you a number. If you ask them, how much money do we invest in cardiac arrest research, it's not tracked. Um, so over a 10 year period, I did a search through NIH. That, so they're all publicly funded. So every grant is available and read about 1500 grants and just categorize them. Is this cardiac arrest or is this not? And when you look on a per death basis, um, for cancer, there's about $9,000 for every person that dies of cancer is being invested for research. Uh, for stroke, about $2,200. Um, cardiac arrest is magnitudes lower, about 91 bucks per death. Um, the following year was down to $46 uh, per death, the same amount of money that's being invested towards ADHD research. Um, so, yeah, ask, yes. How many of those researches, like the diabetes and the cardiac disease, referenced cardiac arrest in the particular research. So yeah, so they, they essentially don't. Um, the big argument, and this was a lot of the reviewers that when we submitted this, is that cardiac arrest is the final pathway of death. So it encompasses everything. So when we're funding MI research, we're funding cardiac arrest. And certainly, we know we overestimate the proportion of cardiac arrests that are due to MI. Certainly it's a large portion, but you guys know that that's not everything. And to study how someone develops an MI or to, 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 to study the endothelium of the coronaries to say, how are you gonna develop a thrombosis? That doesn't help you when the patient is in cardiac arrest. Um, and so overlap exists. When you're studying diabetes research, you're also, you could say, well, that's studying stroke too, because a lot of diabetics will end up with strokes. But unless you're focusing money at how are we going to resuscitate someone, how are we going to provide post-resuscitative care, um, th that funding gets splintered and ultimately not enough for cardiac arrest. So there's certainly overlap, and that's and it's a really, it's a good point. Um, so research. Um, there are different types of research or um, research design for clinical research. Very basically, um, on the bottom of this pyramid is the lowest quality, and that's like case reports. So you guys bring over a month period, five teenagers that are in acute respiratory distress syndrome, and the only history we have is they just started vaping. So then we write that up and we send it, and we say, hey, this is really interesting. This vaping is now on scene, and we have these we've healthy kids who are now in acute respiratory distress syndrome, and that's published. Um, the next higher up would be a case control series. So you have a group of people that have acute respiratory distress syndrome, ARDS. You then go back in time and look, compare them to age match controls to say what risk factors that they have that led to this. Um, next up is a cohort study. So you have a bunch of people in this. This can be retrospective or prospective, but just for simplicity, um, a bunch of people that vape, you follow them over a 10 year period and see what happens essentially. Um, and then you get to RCTs. So randomized control trials are the gold standards. The only thing above that is a meta-analysis meta or systematic review. And that's a group of RCTs that the data is all pulled together, uh, pooled together um, to, uh, to draw conclusions based off of that. 
And RCT is the gold is the gold standard in medicine, and that's what uh, provides information on potential risks and benefits to individuals. Um, for the most part, it's drugs or devices, but can be for other things as well. Um, how just sort of the basics of it? So you have a group of people. You have a, a study question. You have a group of people. Um, you have inclusion exclusion criteria. Ultimately, you enroll some patients, and then they get randomized. Um, and I know I'm going to just to make sure everybody's on the page same page. I'm going to make this very very um, basic, but um, so it's like a flip of a coin. Um, say we want to know, does aspirin in in chest pain uh, decrease heart attack? So for this, we have a bunch of people with chest pain. Half of them randomly would get aspirin. Half of them would randomly get a sugar pill. And then ultimately we'd see, is there any reduction, after adjusting for many things, any reduction in heart attack? Um, things that you that are important are blinding. So... A double blind study means that the investigator and the participant have no idea what group they're in. They don't know if they got aspirin and they don't know if they got sugar pill until the very end when the data is analyzed and unlocked. Um, placebo controlled would mean that the placebo, uh, in this case, the placebo is a sugar pill. And then multi center is always better. Um, the goal with reviewing research is you're asking yourself is the population studied representative of the population you serve? It doesn't help if there's a remote Alaskan population that has some sort of outcome that you're interested in, then you're going to apply that to here in Birmingham. That's probably not the same population. Um, so that's uh, something to consider. So we're going to uh, sort of do sort of create a randomized control trial right here. Um, so I'm going to go skydiving, um, but I have the money for the flight, but I don't have the money for the parachute. And so I want to know if I put a parachute on my back, and I use a parachute, does that actually decrease my risk of dying or breaking or having a traumatic injury? Um, we're going to suspend critical thinking and just say that we want to know, we don't have a randomized control trial for this, so how do we know it works? Just like we don't have a randomized control trial for a lot of things like CPR or no CPR. Um, so for this, we're going to design this trial. So we're going to have a bunch of people that are getting onto a flight. Um, we'll create some sort of inclusion criteria um, and say that, that, that they just want to participate. Uh, we enroll people, and the two, the two groups are half people get a backpack with that's just completely empty, no parachute in it, and the other half get a parachute, and we're going to jump off the plane, and our outcome measure is going to be death or permanent disability trauma, so things that we would care about. And this has actually been done. Um, so, uh, yeah, this has been done. Um, so this was in the British Medical Journal. So the first thing you always ask yourself with um, research is, where is this published? The British Medical Journal is one of the best journals in the world. It's got an impact factor of 30. It's it's real deal. So right away, we have some face validity saying, all right, this is one of the best journals in the world. We're, we're going to read into this. Um, and for this, this is this is the abstract. So the objective is to determine if using a parachute prevents death or major traumatic injury when jumping out of an airplane. So the research question sort of fits what we're going to do. We're about to jump out of a plane. We want to know, are we going to die or are we going to have a traumatic injury if we don't have a parachute? Um, it's a randomized control trial, so we said it's high up on that, that pyramid. Um, and we're going to use private or commercial aircraft. Uh, we screen a bunch of people. A bunch of people say, no way, I'm not going to do this. But 23 people say, yes, I'm in. Let's do it. And the intervention is jumping out of an airplane or helicopter um, with a parachute or no parachute. So it's not blinded. So you find out right away, here's your North Face backpack, you're jumping. No, no, no. <laughs> no you, in this case, you know you got it or not. Um, and here's the conclusions. So, yes. So, um, the results, here we go. The parachute did not significantly reduce death or major injury. So, no one got injured in the parachute or the control group. Statistically significant. Um, well, not statistically significant. So, in this case, the parachute was not statistically superior to the North Face backpack. And here's the conclusion. Parachute use did not reduce death or major traumatic injury when jumping out of an aircraft in the first randomized evaluation of this intervention. So who's signing up to jump out of the plane with a North Face? Save the money for the parachute, right? No, this is, there's got to be something more to this. So let's read the paper. Um, so the, 
there's different ways. You can Google critical appraisal review, um, and there's all different ones that you can to take any paper to say, all right, I'm going to systematically pick this apart because someone's telling me something that I don't, that doesn't make sense. So I'm going to pick this apart and find out what are we missing here? So the first question that I always ask is, what is the study question? Were the groups randomized and was this blinded? So our study question is, this is from the introduction. Um, essentially, it's asking for the efficacy of parachutes in reducing death and major disability when jumping out of an aircraft. So that's what we care about. I don't care if I sprain my ankle when I jump out. I want to know when I land, am I dead or do I have major traumatic injury? So the study question actually is relevant. Would you agree? It's pretty good. Um, and then what's the outcome measure? Um, so this was not blinded. In this case, does it matter? I don't know. Um, and then it was randomized. So the outcome measure is not ankle injury. It is, did you die? Did you have a major traumatic injury? And how did they measure this? Do you have a pulse when you land within the first five minutes? And if you do have a pulse based on this validated injury severity score, were you injured or not? So that seems like it has face validity as well. Um, who was excluded? So this is the, the flow of the patients that are enrolled. So there were 92 patients were screened. 64 said, I'm not taking part in this. There's no way I would do this. Five were deemed unsuitable by the investigator. I don't remember what the deals were. In the paper, we could see what this, what this possibly was. Maybe they were intoxicated. They had been drinking on the plane. It was like, you know what? They don't, they don't have capacity to say that they want to risk life or death um, in this. Um, and then so 23 were randomized. 12 people got a parachute. 11 got an empty backpack. They all jumped out. Um, and then for death and, um, and injury, that was the primary outcome measure. Um, they had some secondary outcome measures that uh, they did at 30 days. And the fact that there was loss to follow up here, that's something you always want to think about when you look at a paper. How many people were excluded? How many people were lost to follow up? Because those can always impact your results. Um, but for death and trauma, everybody filled out the, or everybody was able to be assessed. So were the groups balanced? So this is really important. This is looking at, if you look at age, and I'm sorry, this is small, but if you look at age, sex, race, um, medical history, are they balanced between the two groups? And here, if you go through it, they are. Um, who is excluded? This is something that you really need to pay close attention to. So if you compare the people that took part in the trial and the people that were screened um, that said no way, if those people were screened and were included in the trial, then all of a sudden that could impact your results. So you want to make sure that there's not a big difference between the people that were actually in the trial and are the results biased because um, a bunch of people that would have impacted the outcome were, um, were excluded. And for here, for the most part, we see that uh, other than the fact that everybody that was on a jet said, no way, I'm not jumping out of the jet, um, there was no other big difference. We'll get back to this. Were the results, what were the results and are they significant? So here we see a bunch of zeros. So no one got injured, no one had a traumatic injury through this, and um, the intervention was not statistically significant or um, uh, compared to control. So it did not outperform, the parachute did not outperform uh, an empty backpack in this. Um, so overall, pretty well done, and they have some 30-day outcomes and health status and things like that. Your next question is, what are the big limitations to this study? Can anybody sort of see the big limitation to this study in this chart? Everybody jumped out of the plane. Everybody. Exactly. What was the speed and at what height? And that's at the bottom. Do you notice what's at the bottom of that? This was a stationary aircraft. Um, so not even in the air, jumping out at less than a meter of height. Um, so the point of this is that although this is a randomized control trial attempting to answer our question, it's not actually applicable to your what matters to you because you would be using this data to jump out of a plane that is 6,000, 10,000 feet in the air when if you, unless you read the paper very carefully, you could totally misinterpret the results. And so you can... So, and, and it's more than Facebook. This is everywhere right now, but if you just read an abstract, if you just read the first line of the conclusion, if you just read the title, you can totally misinterpret 
what results were. Um, so every year, British Medical Journal publishes a study that's sort of like a gag study, and it's to prove a point. And for this one, it was to prove a point that you have to pay attention to the details in a study in order to, to apply that to you so that you could wave in your wave up in the air as I have an RCT that proves and it does that jumping out of an airplane without a, without a parachute does not increase your safety. However, this is a stationary aircraft, so it doesn't actually impact what you need in the end. Um, so their conclusion, uh, parachute use compared to backpack control did not reduce death or major traumatic injury when used by participants jumping out of an aircraft in the first randomized control trial. If you stop there, you're in trouble. Um, this has largely resulted from the ability to only recruit participants jumping, jumping from a stationary aircraft on the ground. Um, so I hope you sort of get the point of what this whole thing is, is that it, the details matter. And so when anyone presents any, including my research, you should be skeptical of everyone's research and read the paper very critically um, and before you draw conclusions or, um, or apply this to, to patients or, or anybody else or jumping out of an airplane. What's that? There are a lot of broken bones. So that was medical history. So that was saying, have you ever broken a bone? No one was injured from this because they jumped from that side of that chair. I can't see that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the next is, and this has gotten a lot of play in the news. Oh, this is a peer-reviewed article. What does peer-reviewed mean? So when I submit a paper to a journal, the editor of that journal then assigns two to three, four experts in the field that most of the time are anonymous, will read the paper, and their job is to protect the reader to make sure that what I'm not writing is misleading and that the conclusions, limitations, that all match up. But all peer-reviewed is not created equal. Um, so this is from my junk mail from yesterday. Uh, these are peer-reviewed journals. These are predatory journals that will email you and say, hey, um, do you have any papers that are still, you still haven't been able to publish? You submit to us, pay us $1,800 or something. We'll have it peer-reviewed and it will be published in three weeks. And that's a peer-reviewed journal that someone down the line can get their hands on and say, hey, this is peer-reviewed. Um, so just peer review is important, but just keep that in mind that peer review isn't everything. Um, next, we'll sort of hit on eCPR. Um, so we, do, we, do have a, we do have a comment online. Uh, it says that King County, Washington makes it very easy for all citizens. CPR. They also use apps to notify citizens when somebody notifies 911 for cardiac arrest. They have huge file rates because they devote a lot of time, money, and resources to out of hospital cardiac arrest file. I would also, to the point you just made, I would make sure that they are reckoning their cardiac arrest survivals in a standardized format. Mm -hmm. So at one point in history, they were an outlier there in their methodology for identifying survival and cardiac arrest. Um, but I think those are good points, and I think it speaks to how complicated and multifactorial cardiac arrest is as a research problem. Would you agree? Totally agree. Um, Seattle is, and King County in particular, um, they are have done very a very good job of community involvement. Um, if you look at places like Phoenix that historically didn't have great outcomes, and they now do have great outcomes, how did they do it? It was robust telephone CPR program, um, as well as community education um, and, uh, and things like that. So it's beyond just Seattle. If you compare other countries like Denmark that sort of did it nationwide, um, have had remarkable results. Um, everybody to graduate high school had to be CPR certified. They had all sorts of initiatives that really start on a community level. Um, so it, it's, a, it's a good point that that person mentions. Um, so eCPR, what is eCPR? It is um, actually, well, take a step back. So what happens when standard ACLS fails? So you go through your whole algorithm, you've gone through two or three times, the patient is still pulse pulseless. What happens next? Well, a certain period of time happens where unfortunately this person's refractory to um, therapy and there's not a lot of options left. And so um, in most places in the country and in the world, that's unfortunately just time of death there. Um, eCPR is an emerging strategy that's not offered everywhere. It's very select locations, um, but it is a potential bridge to definitive therapy for these patients that are refractory to standard care. 
Um, so what happens in general for eCPR? So extracorporeal means outside of the body, cardiopulmonary resuscitation. So there's two large catheters that are placed into, for the most part for eCPR, it's gonna be in the groin. One's gonna be into the artery and one's gonna be into the vein. The one that's in the vein is sort of advanced pretty high up, so it's just below the right atrium. And that's connected to a pump that's actually sucking the blood, the deoxygenated blood from the venous side out of the body. It gets put through an oxygenator and then pumped back in to the artery. And so there's actually retrograde flow. So the flow would actually be coming up here through um, the common iliac, up through the aorta, and then all the way up to perfuse the brain. So it's actually retrograde flow. And um, this is cardiopulmonary bypass. This is ECMO. Um, ECPR is also called extracorporeal life support, ECLS, um, but essentially it's providing oxygenated blood. It's bypassing the heart and the lungs in this case, because this is V, take a step back. This is VA ECMO. This means venous arterial ECMO. That means there's a cannula on the venous side, there's a cannula on the arterial side. There's also VV ECMO, and that's for things like commonly would be influenza with um, acute respiratory distress syndrome. The heart is still is fine, so you don't need to bypass the heart, you're just bypassing the lungs. In this case, this person is in cardiac arrest. If we bypass only the lungs, that's not helping us. So this is venous arterial ECMO. We're bypassing the heart and lungs so that we can pr provide perfusion to the brain and other vital organs that's all oxygenated. Um, and this is sort of ECMO technology has been around since like the 50s or 60s. The problem is it used to be the size of a large refrigerator. Now the McKay unit is about that. It's about the size of that coffee maker there. Um, so they're now portable. Um, and so in recent years, this is becoming a strategy in places that have a lot of resources um, as a potential salvage uh, therapy uh, for those in refractory arrest. And so there's a registry called the ELSO registry. It's, it's specifically for eCPR and eCLS, and it's worldwide. And so we performed one of the first analysis uh, a few years ago. It was retrospective, just uh, worldwide. What's the survival rate? And survival rate in general was 27%, which is actually pretty remarkable when you think about it, because what is this population? The population is refractory to therapy. So that means without ECLS, they're deceased, and 27% of those patients are actually leaving the hospital alive. So that's really um, pretty remarkable and pretty encouraging. Um, but I hope you're thinking, well, what does survival mean? Is this an hour out? And yes, they have a pulse, but they're in a long-term care facility. And that data wasn't available in this registry, so we don't know what survival means. But now we do, and we have some pretty interesting data. So this was a paper that was recently published in circulation. This is out of Minnesota, which in the country right now is probably the best place um, to be in refractory arrest um, for this reason. So this is, this is looking at 160 patients, consecutive patients, um, with out-of-hospital cardiac arrest that are refractory to standard therapy, um, and it's compared to a historical groups from the ALP study, which you guys took, a part, um, to, uh, took part in. Um, the population is 18 to 75 years old. You have to be presumed cardiac etiology. You get, uh, you have an initial shockable rhythm. You get defibrillated three times without ROSC, or you get defibrillated once or twice, and you go into a non-shockable rhythm. Everybody gets 300 of amio. They have to be small enough to have the Lucas work uh, for their body habitus, and they have to be able to get to a cath lab. So in this, in this case, the cannulation, the cannulas are being placed in the cath lab you have to be able to get there within 30 minutes uh, for this group. They also had three other criteria that I, that I know the slide dropped off because I was just reviewing it. You have to have an end title greater than 10 when you show up to the hospital. You have to have a lactate less than 18. Um, and you have to uh, have, um, oh, they do an arterial stick to make sure that you've been bagging them enough and oxygenating that they have a PaO2 greater than 50. Um, and so this is this is the results here, and and basically the the on your left of the left of the screen is the eCPR group, and on the very bottom this is neurologically intact survival. So this is a CPC of one or two. These are people that are functioning. A CPC ones are going back to work. CPC twos maybe not able to go completely back to work, um, but certainly meaningful life left. And it was 39% in this group compared to a historical group from the ALP study, which is 23%. So a pretty large increase. Um, in neurologically intact survival. Um, so Dr. Kirk, yes. so the interesting thing about that to me is how narrow the inclusion was 
on those patients because it's pretty hard to find 160 uh, shockable rhythm cardiac arrest to study. How long did it take to get that? So it's over a four year period for them. Um, and it, if you look at the breakdown, most of them were public arrests. So in a public location, um, most of them were bystander witnessed. Um, so if you if you have um, a bystander witness arrest, the shockable uh, rhythm rates are much higher than if you just find somebody. That's sort of like a separate thing that I find is so interesting. If you found somebody in cardiac arrest in the 70s, if you walk up to somebody that's in cardiac arrest, the chances of them being a shockable rhythm, majority of people were in shockable rhythms. Now you fast forward 40 or so years, most people are found in non-shockable rhythms. Why is that? And no one really knows. Um, we think if you plot ICD placement, so over the past four, uh, 40 years, ICD placement has gone way up. So a lot of these advanced heart failure patients that are at risk for a shockable rhythm get ICDs in their chest. It sort of mirrors the decline in shockable rhythms. The thought being that if you have an ICD in your chest that's functioning, you can't go into a shockable rhythm. Your only option is a non-shockable rhythm. Otherwise, you would be getting shocked. The other thought is that so many people are on low-dose beta blockers, and this is a stretch, that people may think that if you're on a low-dose beta blocker, that may actually at baseline be preventing some tachyarrhythmias. I don't 100% buy that, but you'll hear people saying that. Um, but for this group, public arrest, bystander witnessed, um, the chances of being a shock over there are much higher than certainly if you just found somebody down. So I guess the, the one of the things that I find interesting about this is that they restricted it to shock or rhythm arrest. Mm -hmm. Has anyone done a study today that included non shockable rhythm arrest? Not, not that I know because we're still very early. So this is sort of new wave, new generation stuff. We still don't have a randomized control trial, which we're going to talk about in a few minutes. Um, so right now, this is resource intensive. So all the institutions that are putting the money towards this are, are diverting that towards favorable circumstances for the arrest, meaning if this, is an, if this is someone that's found down, unknown downtime, no bystander CPR, they're in a Sicily right off the bat, um, no one's including those patients in the trial just because of how many res the resource intensiveness that goes into this and the likelihood of meaningful survival in that group, I think we'd all agree, is, is pretty low. However, if Actually, you're... Actually, here we would not agree with you on that. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Um, We've actually had more success with our non chocolate rhythm patients than we have with our chocolate. So certainly PEA, PEA reversible and things like that. But if you look at a national level, the data would disagree. The, the data on a national level, PEA is around 9% or so survival. Asystole is around 1% or 2%, whereas a shockable rhythm is going to be around 40%. So nationally, when you look globally and nationally, um, the shockable rhythm side has much higher survival and much higher neurologically impact survival. Do you think that's because... And a lot, maybe other states. I know old school mentality was you get on the scene if it was in a systole, if they had been down for an unknown amount of time, typically you wouldn't work it. As opposed to now, the mentality is they're in a systole, it doesn't matter how long they've been down, you're going to go ahead and try to work it. Certainly the attitude going in. I think one of the, the downsides. The downsides in general are most people that resuscitate cardiac arrest unfortunately don't get to see the patient when they leave the hospital alive. And it, it, it creates a lot of times this confirmation bias in, your, in, in yourself that no one does well. Um, and then when we look at the data and say, well, these shock rhythms don't do well, it, there's certainly something that needs to be overcome for a lot of people to be putting the effort in the same effort on the 75-year-old non-shockable rhythm as you would for the 35-year-old shockable rhythm. But I think that there is, I think we can all acknowledge that there, there's something different in the room um, when it's a 28-year-old in a shockable rhythm than the 90-year-old that was found down unshockable and no bystander CPR, things like that. At the same time, elderly patients in non-shockable rhythms can still do very well, and we have data that actually is pretty remarkable that, that you can do very well. Um, 
The timeline is also really quite interesting. So if you look at the breakdown of how much CPR was done, so for the group that had 20 to 29 minutes of CPR, um, eight out of eight, hundred percent of people survived neurologically intact that were put on eCPR. If you compare that to the age matched group um, from the ALPS trial, about 24% survive survival neurologically intact. Um, go out to uh, more than 40 minutes. No one in the ALPS trial survived neurologically intact with more than 40 minutes of CPR. Whereas for this group, 25% survived neurologically intact at 40 minutes. Beyond 60 minutes, um, I don't remember what the actual numbers were, but it was 19% of patients beyond 60 minutes actually survived neurologically intact, which is really, if you sit back and think about that, an hour of CPR before being put on pump, 19% of patients surviving, um, leaving the hospital alive, being able to communicate with their family members. That's uh, Pretty remarkable stuff. Single center. So what we talked about with the RCT, this is not a randomized control trial, and it's single center. Um, so there are limitations, and they're using a matched group from a completely different study. There's certain limitations, but this is hypothesis driving data that leads to a randomized control trial. Um, I think we can all agree, pretty encouraging stuff if you're in, if you're the person that's pulseless for an hour um, and they're doing CPR. The coolest is what's going on in Europe. So this is in Paris. They're actually cannulating people in the field. So they have EMS physicians that are in the field that if you're on the subway, they'll actually do cut downs, femoral cut downs, and put people on pumps. So they don't wait to take you to the hospital like they were doing in Minnesota and like what's being done in Michigan and San Diego right now, Seattle, Pittsburgh. Um, here, they're actually cannulating in the field. Um, and if you look at some of the Paris data, um, it's pretty, it's, it's pretty cool stuff, uh, the survival rates. Um, and they'll be just cannulating in a museum. What about Tokyo? Some yeah. Um, yeah, Tokyo, um, a lot of, uh, um, a lot of uh, places overseas are having like really good outcomes. Um, and uh, I believe in Tokyo, it's still, I don't think it's pre-hospital cannulation. I think it's being done in the hospital. Um, as far as I know, Czech Republic and um, Paris um, in France are the um, are the two big publishers for pre-hospital cannulation, um, uh, which I think is the coolest. Um, if you look uh, internationally, of what are there's really no guidelines yet on who gets put in. This is uh, chief sort of what you were mentioning of who are the candidates. But if you pool the data of what's being published internationally, you see that most people are including witnessed arrest. That if you are unwitnessed arrest, they're not um, at this time, at least without randomized data, um, putting the resources towards unwitnessed arrest. For the most part, they everyone's getting bystander CPR so that we can perfuse that brain. Um, shockable rhythm is very common. Um, no other major comorbidity. So I guess sort of like looking at the patient and seeing that, I don't, I don't know how that's actually done. Um, end tidal CO2, so um, uh, good end tidal CO2 waveforms um, and anybody that could do point of care lactic. Those are some of the most common um, screening criteria for who gets cannulated. Um, and then uh, sort of being able to immediately transport um, to an eCPR facility. We know that it seems like the time frame is 60 minutes. In Minnesota, they're get, if they get people on pump by 90, they're still seeing um, good outcomes, but it's 60 minutes from time of arrest to the time that you're being cannulated in an emergency department or in a cath lab or in Europe out in the field. That seems to be the hour that you need to um, be able to get on ECMO to have a good result. Um, and this is a slide that I just threw in in the last minute. So this is a paper that I have out um, with resuscitation right now um, that I'll sort of go through. I'm sorry I didn't include the reference and everything. Um, but so this is looking at the CARES database. Um, so over a five-year period in CARES, um, this is all bystander witnessed arrest. And the, the, the x-axis is scene time interval. So this is you guys arriving on scene the moment you're at the patient's side to the time you leave to go to the hospital. Um, and then survival, neurologically intact survival is on the y-axis, up and down. Um, and it's just looking over time, what is the likelihood of a patient leaving the hospital neurologically intact based on how long you're on scene? And what you can really see here is that the drop-off is at 20 minutes. So I'm, I'm a proponent of stay and play. I think that um, 
the scoop and run philosophy. Um, there's some data to it, but for the most part, I think what you guys are able to do in the field is exactly what we're able to do in the emergency department and that transport and everything sort of limits um, limits things. Um, so at least on a national level with retrospective data, we see this pretty sharp drop off at about 20 minutes. So for, this is sort of hypothesis uh, driven, or um, but it seems like if you're in a place that has an ECMO capability and you need to be on pump in an hour, probably working it on scene for about 20 minutes before reaching out to say, hey, do we have access to eCPR? This is, um, actually, I'll, I'll, I don't want to go down that path, but um, it seems like 20 minutes is, is the time frame where patients start to have a, a pretty big drop off. But what's pretty remarkable is even at 60 minutes on here, it's about a 4% survival rate um, nationally. Again, this is bystander witnessed arrests, so not all arrests. Um, and this is the care save base. Yes. We actually, in, um, here just at the center point fire, since we've been doing the care state, of, we're actually seeing a, an average time to ROSC right about 30 minutes, mm -hmm. which has surprised a lot of people, including yeah. me, that it was that long. I think most people that have worked here and seen some of those calls would agree that um, in the past, we would have never expected to achieve ROSC after 20 minutes. Yeah. And um, but I'm glad to see this data because prior to seeing that anybody had studied this, that 20 minute mark has always seemed very uh, random to me. Like somebody yeah. just picked out 20 minutes. Totally. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, no, totally. Um, and we're getting towards the end here. So this is uh, just, this, this slide's not meant for everybody to read, but uh, essentially there are, this is, ongoing. There's a lot of research being done for eCPR. There are four randomized control trials. The one in Paris down on the bottom um, should have just recently completed. I don't know if COVID impacted this, but should have recently completed. The only one that's going on in the country right now is Eroka out of Michigan. Um, they have a 20 minute time frame. So if you're out in the fields, um, they are, medics are calling University of Michigan at 20 minutes and saying, hey, we have somebody that meets this criteria, we're 20 minutes in, and they're actually randomizing people to either stay and just continue to work it, or actually half the patients are being transported uh, to be put on pump within an hour. Um, so that that's something to look forward to in the near future. Um, UAB, I talked to Michael Kurz last night and told him that I was going to be giving this talk, um, and he wanted me to just sort of give a plug just to say that we're, we're certainly not at a place right now where, where these refractory people are just getting put on pump all the time, but we have the capability. Um, we are able to do it. We have um, the, uh, the new sort of EDICU area, the resuscitation bay that we're hoping to be in the near future doing things like Roboa um, and potentially down the line um, having EM physicians uh, cannulate. As of right now, it's through vascular surgery um, and things like that, but for, um, it's not impossible for it to be done. It's certainly not standard, um, but we do have the capabilities at UAB um, to put people on pump. Uh, my fiance actually works in the CICU where half the patients there are on pump. They're not all cardiac arrest, they're on for other reasons, um, but eCPR is, is uh, or um, ECMO is very common at UAB. Um, so yeah, so any uh, questions, comments? And thanks so much, guys. Yep, so we do have a, a question from online. Um, Doc, what Birmingham area hospitals, if you know, you may not know this, have eCPR capability? Um, I just heard recently of a case that St. Vincent's put somebody on pump. Um, I, I I don't know the, the answer. I, I would think that, um, I mean, I'm from UAB, but I, th I think that we probably have the most resources when it comes to eCPR. Um, the vast majority of hospitals will certainly not. Um, but I, I was told that St. Vincent's does have the capability, um, at least at least for one case that I heard about. Um, but I would say that UAB is probably the, the surest bet um, to have the resources needed. Yeah, so that, that leads us into a new argument, which greatly affects the data, in my opinion, in this area, which is if we have a cardiac arrest patient who's not achieved ROSC on the scene, then we're going to take the patient to the closest hospital, which mm -hmm. for us is always going to be St. Vincent's East. It would be different for other departments and other parts of the yeah. county. Um, but those hospitals all, uh, I'm not 
criticizing any particular hospital or propping up any hospital, but okay. there's a wide range of response and capability with each one of those emergency departments. Yeah. So like you're talking about your survivability for cardiac arrest depends on where you live, where you have your cardiac arrest. It also depends on which hospital you're closest to in this area, mm. which shift you're working, which EMS crew responds to you, who's on duty at the hospital when you get there, both uh, physicians and other staff. So it's just a huge number of variables. Totally, and I think that and the variability is there. Um, I hope I, I don't want to miss or, or misrepresent that this that this is mainstream. This is sorely. This is totally not mainstream. Um, I was actually um, I'm I'm excited that Dr. Ferguson included this in the talk. I was kind of surprised um, that ECMO and ECPR would be included in the curriculum. Um, so this is something to look forward to in the future. It is possible now. It is a rarity. Um, but what you bring up sort of goes to the big argument on should there be cardiac arrest resuscitation centers. Yes. Um, and and I and most people in resuscitation science would say yes that if you compare it to other um, to other disease processes that's where outcomes have really improved to have centers that are specialized um, in something like cardiac arrest um, certainly we're not there right now but there's an argument towards, towards moving in that direction so interestingly online uh, we have a comment from James Robinson who's a friend of all of ours uh, out of the Springville Fire Department who had a recent out of hospital cardiac arrest, by the way, which he obviously has filed. Um, and he comments that in my recent MI and cardiac arrest, I was on pump ECMO and Impelovad at St. Vincent's East. So St. Vincent's East uh, did that for him. Yeah. Um, and I'm not certain that may actually be the case that someone mentioned to me because um, it was one of the EMS folks that was after a cardiac arrest had just transported somebody and we stabilized them done to the cat lab because it was a post arrest semi and the crew was still around. So I was talking with them just about, sort of like what was it like on the scene and everything. Um, and, and one of the medics actually mentioned the case. And so that actually might be the gentleman that's listening right now, which is uh, remarkably cool. Um, in like I sort of mentioned earlier, um, in emergency medicine, it's, it's, it's challenging because most of the time we don't get to see the great outcomes. And it sounds like this individual had a great outcome. So if they're willing to come talk at, um, and I can facilitate it at uh, UAB for one of our conferences, our resident conferences, I would love to get a survivor um, to be able to give their, um, their uh, perspective. And I think it would really be uplifting considering how many arrests we treat and unfortunately they they leave our emergency department and we never get to follow up. Um, so if that person's interested in with the able to contact me, that'd be great. Sure, I uh, will uh, share his contact information with you. All right, does anybody have any other questions or comments? Well, Dr. Dr. Kirk, thank you so much. Great talk, really appreciate it. And uh, thanks to everybody online. Uh, if you tried to fill out the attendance form earlier, I had a setting wrong and it wouldn't let you, but that should be fixed now, so please try again. The password for today's class is research. So the form will ask you for a password. The password is research. So thanks everybody for attending and we'll see you in a couple of weeks. I had to look that one up. Really?